like to welcome you to our webinar today on nutrition and AMD, the latest research, which is going to be presented by Professor Barmini Gopinath. Uh, this professor is an epidemiologist and her research is focused on assessing links between lifestyle risk factors, including dietary factors and smoking with the development, progression and treatment of age-related macular degeneration or AMD. She currently leads internationally unique trials, including a trial which aims to reduce the burden of distress in carers supporting family members with AMD as well as an intervention to improve dietary behaviours of AMD patients through a novel telephone coaching program. She has published over 200 publications and her research has attracted over 400 media stories with an estimated audience of 210 million people worldwide. So thank you so much for joining us today um, and I can't wait to hear um, your presentation. Thanks Delini for the introduction. Uh, so uh, it's a real pleasure to be presenting uh, the latest research around nutrition and AMD and I'll also be touching on some of the research that we've done as a group uh, at the Centre for Vision Research. Uh, so firstly, just some background on AMD. Uh, it's a condition that affects around 1 million Australians. Uh, it's a a condition that's associated with aging. So mostly people aged 50 and over are affected by this condition. It is a multifactorial disease, which means that there are several genetic and environmental factors uh, that are thought to play a role in the development of the condition and its progression. So these risk factors uh, can be broadly divided into non-modifiable risk factors and modifiable risk factors. So in terms of non-modifiable risk factors, uh, this includes age, which is the strongest risk factor for AMD, and also family history of AMD. Uh, and there are certain genetic risk mutations that are thought to increase uh, the risk of developing the condition. So for example, mutations in the complement factor H or CFH gene and mutations in the ARMS2 genes are thought to increase the risk of developing AMD by around two to four fold. Uh, and then there are the modifiable risk factors. So these are lifestyle risk factors and smoking is the strongest lifestyle risk factor for AMD. And there is evidence to show that current smokers compared to non-smokers develop AMD around five to 10 years earlier. In addition, being overweight or obese can also increase an individual's chances of developing AMD. And of course, dietary factors are also thought to play an important role in the development and progression of AMD. So the presentation today um, is very much focused on nutrition because it is the second most important modifiable risk factor after smoking in terms of reducing the occurrence and worsening of existing AMD lesions. So what does the current evidence suggest in terms of what AMD patients should be aiming for? Well, they should be aiming for increasing their consumption of dark green leafy vegetables. They should be aiming to eat uh, fresh fruit daily and choosing low glycemic index or low GI foods rather than high GI foods and eating fish at least twice a week as well as eating a handful of nuts two to three times per week. Uh, so essentially AMD patients should be aiming to have a healthy and balanced diet to ensure that they get the right amount of nutrients um, to maintain optimal macular health. So in the presentation, I'm going to sort of present the research around each of these food groups and why these food groups are really important in the context of AMD. So vegetables uh, are one of the most important food groups um, for, sorry. Uh, 
I'm just trying to get back to my presentation. Sorry. Um, so vegetables are an important food group. Um, the Australian Dietary Guidelines recommend that adults should be consuming around five serves of vegetables per day. Uh, and different vegetables have different nutrients like vitamins and minerals, which are needed for healthy eyes. And lutein and zeaxanthine are really one of the most important antioxidants and they belong to a group of antioxidants known as carotenoids, which are naturally found in the macula. And dark green leafy vegetables are an essential source um, of lutein and zeaxanthine. So as a result, they're really essential to maintaining good eye health. Of course, there are other vegetables that also contain lutein and zeaxanthine, but it's in much smaller amounts. So what does five serves per day look like? This should constitute mainly dark green leafy vegetables. So one serve is about a cup raw or half cup cooked of vegetables like kale, spinach and uh, parsley. In addition, you can incorporate a serve, which is again about one cup raw or half cup cooked of other non-starchy vegetables like broccoli, green beans and peas. Fruits are also another important food group um, and the Australian Dietary Guidelines recommend that adults should be aiming for around two serves of fruit per day. And high levels of vitamin C are found in many fruits, but particularly the ones that are shown there like oranges and strawberries, as well as kiwi fruit. And vitamin C uh, has been shown uh, to reduce the risk of AMD progression in certain individuals when it's combined with other antioxidants like lutein and zeaxanthine, uh, vitamin E, as well as zinc and copper. And I'll go into a bit more detail about that later on. However, if fresh fruits are not available, frozen and canned fruits, particularly that found in natural juice rather than syrup, are great alternatives but um, all adults should be aiming for a rainbow of fruits and vegetables as part of their habitual diet to ensure that they're getting a, an adequate amount of nutrients uh, to maintain optimal macular health. So low GI foods are another important food group in the context of AMD. Uh, so just a little bit of background on glycemic index or GI. This is a system which ranks carbohydrates in the foods based on how they influence blood sugar levels. So, sorry, just, I... sorry uh, Professor Gopinath, I think um, your presentation might be a little bit stuck. Uh, we can just see the one on vegetables at the moment. Um, I oh. don't think it, sorry about that, uh, it hasn't okay. progressed from there. Okay, all right. Oh, sorry. No, all good. Is that, there can you go. see it? Yes, that's, yes, that's perfect. Thank you. Sorry. Oh, no, I just need to, because when I do that, and then I can't see the presentation, actually. Uh, hang on. Um, okay, all good? Yes, I can perfect. see that. Yeah, okay. Sorry about that. Um, so did you want me to go back to the fruits or just continue? I'll just um, continue. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so low GI foods uh, compared to high GI foods are those that are digested and absorbed uh, at a slower rate. And low GI foods as a result uh, increase blood sugar levels and insulin levels at a much slower and lower level um, than high GI foods. So there's quite a bit of research now to show that people who eat more low GI foods rather than high GI foods have a lower risk of developing a range of chronic conditions like heart disease, diabetes and obesity, and they also have a lower risk of developing AMD in the longer term. 
So one way you can ensure that you're getting low GI foods um, in your diet is when you're shopping to look for the low GI symbol that appears on packaged products. So these are the foods that have been tested to be low GI. So this is an easy way uh, to ensure that you're getting the right type of foods in your diet. But typically low GI foods are those that um, that are found in vegetables, fruits, and whole grain breads and cereals, as well as legumes. And so if you're looking at low GI breads, there are a range of options like multigrain bread, sourdough, and there are also low GI cereal options like oat bran and muesli. And oats are a really good low GI option. And with rice and pasta, there's also various low GI options um, available. So with meat and alternatives, the Australian Dietary Guidelines recommend that adults should be aiming for around two to three serves of meat or alternatives uh, per day. And so that's 120 grams in total per day. Uh, and there is data to show that processed meats may increase the risk of developing AMD and its progression. So it's recommended that we should be aiming to have fresh meat instead, which is a good source of zinc. And uh, we know that zinc is an important nutrient for the macula um, because it's associated with reduced progression of AMD. Uh, in addition, fish and seafood should be eaten at least twice a week. Um, and they are a great source of omega-3 fatty acids. And these fatty acids are also important nutrients for uh, macular health. And uh, oily fish like uh, salmon, sardines and mackerel are really rich in omega-3 fatty acids. So these are recommended. Uh, in addition, eggs and raw pistachio nuts are meat alternatives, which are rich in lutein and zeaxanthin as well. And so um, these are things that you could also incorporate as part of your habitual diet uh, to ensure good eye health. So with dairy and dairy alternatives, um, the guidelines around this is that adults should be consuming varying serves of reduced fat dairy, depending on their age and gender. Uh, and dairy foods are great sources of calcium and protein. And calcium, for example, has antioxidative and anti-inflammatory properties. Uh, and there is research now to suggest that consuming less dairy and calcium over a period of several years uh, is linked to a higher risk of developing late stage AMD. And for those of you who follow a vegan diet or who have lactose intolerance or are allergic to dairy, um, there are a range of dairy alternatives um, that are fortified or enriched with calcium, such as soy milk, almond milk, and oat milk. Uh, there is also yogurt, available that's uh, made from these uh, milk alternatives. And with cheese, there's dairy-free cheese available. Hard cheese like cheddar and Swiss has very little lactose uh, compared to the soft cheeses like brie. And so they can be very well tolerated if you do have a, a lactose intolerance. So with the supplements, um, so a supplement is essentially a product which contains nutrients, and while these nutrients are often found naturally in food and they're probably better absorbed by the body when it's consumed in this way, um, not all of us are able to get the required amount of nutrients by eating the required amounts of foods. So supplements can be quite helpful in this instance. Uh, and there are certain supplements that are recommended for AMD patients. And uh, this recommendation comes or is based on data from a large US study or trial known as age-related eye disease study, ARIDS trial. And this showed that supplements containing uh, high doses of antioxidants like vitamin C, E, and lutein and zeaxanthin, and as well as zinc, um, can reduce AMD progression rates by around 25%. Uh, the follow-up, or ARIDS-2, uh, recommended replacing one of the original nutrients with lutein and zeaxanthin. 
So this table shows what the Arad2 supplements constitute. So you can use this table to try and help you choose the right sort of supplement for your AMD. However, uh, it is important to consult with your eye care uh, healthcare professional uh, or a dietitian before you make any changes to the supplements uh, that you might be taking or before you take a new supplement. Uh, it's also important to know that these ARID supplements are not helpful for all AMD patients. Um, so generally, these ARID supplements are recommended for AMD patients who have intermediate stage AMD in one or both eyes, uh, as these supplements can be helpful uh, in terms of minimizing uh, progression to late stage AMD. In addition, it's also recommended for patients who have late stage AMD, whether it be dry or wet in one eye, um, as it could help in terms of minimizing uh, the development of AMD in the second or other eye. Uh, it isn't, these sort of supplements are not recommended for people who have early AMD or who have no AMD signs or any other combination that I've not mentioned. So just to summarize the current research on nutrition and AMD. So we know that having a genetic risk of AMD can increase the chances of the disease developing by around four times. What we also now know is that those individuals who carry these risk mutations, if they have regular consumption of fish uh, and zinc containing food, uh, such as meat, spinach and nuts, they can reduce their risk of developing this condition um, close to those levels of individuals who don't carry um, these genetic risk mutations. Uh, in addition, um, there is research now showing that supplements containing high doses of antioxidants like vitamin C, E, and lutein and zeaxanthine um, can help to reduce progression of AMD by more than 25%. And lutein and zeaxanthine, so these are the antioxidants that are found in the macula, in particular have shown to be potentially effective in younger adults, people with late stage AMD, or those who have a higher genetic risk of developing the condition. Uh, in addition, low glycemic index foods um, are thought to be beneficial because high GI foods have been shown to increase the risk of development of AMD and its progression. So low GI options are generally recommended. But it is important to know that um, you should always consult your doctor before you make any changes to your diet, lifestyle or before taking a supplement. So the remaining part of the uh, presentation, I would like to focus on some of the recent research that we have done as a group. And much of this research has been focused on the Blue Mountains Eye Study or BMES. And so this is a landmark eye study um, which examined residents aged 49 years and older who were living in uh, two postcode areas within the Blue Mountains region. So at baseline, we examined 3,654 participants. And this is a population that's very similar to the general Australian population of older adults, um, except that the participants were from a higher socioeconomic status and there were more Caucasians um, in our population. And we were able to measure dietary intake in around 80% of people who underwent uh, the clinical examinations. And we also documented uh, AMD signs in this uh, cohort of participants. Uh, so why do we as a group focus on lifestyle risk factors? Well, there's some key reasons for this. Um, firstly, there are only limited uh, treatment options that are available for AMD patients. And while anti-VEGF therapies uh, have been proven to be effective in reducing vision loss in those who have wet AMD. Uh, it's not, not all AMD patients respond well. 
Uh, in addition, these therapies can be costly and there is a high monthly, bi-monthly treatment burden that's associated with anti-VEGF therapies. And still there is currently no um, treatment for people who have the dry form of AMD. So research on lifestyle risk factors is quite attractive uh, because by eliminating these modifiable risk factors, the likelihood that AMD develops or progresses, particularly to its late stage, could be reduced, or at least its age of onset um, delayed. In addition, this type of research could help us to develop um, relatively simple lifestyle recommendations uh, that are tailored to AMD patients that eye health care practitioners could implement. And, and this in turn could allow for appropriate referral to other healthcare professionals like dietitians uh, and smoking cessation specialists who could help AMD patients make positive changes to their lifestyle. So uh, two years ago, we looked at a range of dietary factors. So I'm going to present most of the research that we've done in this space um, of two to three years, looking at uh, specific nutrients and risk of AMD development in the Blue Mountains cohort. So firstly, we looked at flavonoids. So flavonoids are powerful antioxidants, uh, which are found in a range of fruits and vegetables, uh, and also beverages like green tea and red wine. And uh, we wanted to look at flavonoids because we know they have important anti-inflammatory benefits and antioxidant benefits um, in, in, for health. But prior to our study, there had been very little research that had focused on flavonoid intake and AMD risk. So we looked at six flavonoid uh, classes and we looked at uh, some of the flavonoid compounds that are found in each of these classes, and also some of the uh, key foods and beverages that uh, contribute to flavonoid intake. Uh, so, for example, flavonols uh, are found in um, uh, apples, onions, and tea, and quercetin is an important flavonoid compound that belongs to this particular class. The flavone class of flavonoids are found primarily in vegetables. Flavin 3 oils like captions can be found in grapes and wine and tea. And flavonones like hesperidin, which is an important flavonoid compound, is found typically in citrus fruits like lemons and oranges. So the main finding when we looked at all these flavonoid classes and all these flavonoid compounds, as well as the foods and beverages, the main finding was um, hesperidin intake seemed to have a modest but protective effect against the development of late stage AMD. And we explored this a bit further and we looked at those foods that contribute to hesperidin intake. So this was the citrus fruits. And the strongest finding we found uh, was those participants who had one or more oranges per day versus those who didn't eat any oranges had around a 60% reduced risk of developing late stage AMD. And this association persisted even after we'd accounted for the intake of vitamin C in these participants which gave further support to the fact that it's actually the flavonoid compound in oranges which could be exerting this protective effect. So this was quite a novel finding um, and it led to a lot of uh, media interest and we got a lot of articles on this and they had some interesting headings like an orange a day keeps macular degeneration away, uh, orange a day slash with risk of falling eyesight. So um, it was really good to see uh, the interest that this research generated. But it is a novel finding, so we do need other studies to confirm and verify what we found in the Blue Mountains cohort. So another piece of research um, that came out last year focused on the consumption of eggs and risk of developing AMD in the Blue Mountains cohort. And the key finding from this particular publication was that those participants who had two to four eggs per week versus those who had less than one egg per week uh, had around a 49% reduced risk 
of developing late stage AMD. And this uh, protective effect was more apparent when we looked at wet AMD rather than dry AMD. And uh, we speculate or hypothesize that the protective effect of eggs um, is probably due to the fact that they are a rich source of lutein and zeaxanthin, and these are carotenoids that can help uh, maintain optimal macular health. In addition, we also know that eggs are a source of vitamin D, and there is evidence to show that vitamin D intake can minimize risk of developing AMD. But again, it's a very novel finding, so we do need other studies to verify what we found, but also to tease out uh, the underlying mechanisms that could explain um, this protective effect. But because it was a novel finding, again, it led to a lot of media interest, and it was actually featured on the Channel 9 Evening News, and uh, Channel 9 actually tweeted about our research. Um, so again, it was good to see uh, the interest that our research was generating. So in addition to looking at lifestyle factors like dietary factors in isolation, we thought it was important to look at the combined influence of health behaviours on risk of AMD development. Uh, and so in the Blue Mountains cohort, we developed a health behaviour score, which was calculated by allocating one point for each poor health behaviour, including current smoking, consuming less than four serves per day of fruits and vegetables, uh, engaging in less than three episodes of physical activity per week and having more than two alcoholic drinks per day. So what we found is that older adults who engaged in all four poor health behaviours uh, versus those who did not engage in any of these uh, poor health behaviours had a five-fold greater likelihood of having any AMD signs. And this was substantially more uh, when we looked at late stage AMD. So if they were engaging in these poor health behaviors, they had a close to 34 fold greater odds of having late AMD lesions. Uh, so this, what the findings suggest to us is that uh, it's important that eye health care practitioners uh, look at or take a more holistic approach in addressing the lifestyle of AMD patients because there's likely to be greater gains instead in terms of um, addressing a whole lifestyle rather than focusing on specific lifestyle factors. So future research directions for our group, we are hoping to apply some of the theoretical evidence on links between nutrition and AMD uh, into clinical practice. So one of the projects that um, is very much doing this is uh, an evidence-based dietary intervention that is tailored specifically to AMD patients. Um, and we're trying to develop and implement this currently. In addition, we also want to establish whether smoking, physical activity and dietary factors could influence long-term treatment outcomes in wet AMD patients who are presenting for anti-VEGF therapy. So in terms of the latter uh, research direction, uh, my student, um, INFL student, Harshal Denara, who's actually just wrapped up with us, uh, his research was very much focused on this. And he looked at a range of dietary factors. And out of all the factors he looked at, dietary zinc intake was the one that came up quite strongly. So what he found is those wet AMD patients who are presenting for anti-VEGF therapy, um, those patients who had low zinc intake in their diet had poorer treatment outcomes 12 months later. So by poorer treatment outcomes, uh, we mean that they had higher or greater fluid presence in the macula. They had a greater central macular thickness. So these are outcomes that are associated with more vision loss or greater vision loss. Uh, in addition, he looked at a range of other factors, but there was no significant associations observed. He also looked at smoking, which was quite interesting, and, see, and to see whether this influences treatment outcomes in the long term. Uh, what he found is those patients presenting for uh, treatment 
who were current smokers versus those who were non-smokers actually had developed the disease around five and a half years earlier. Uh, so they had a younger age of onset. And current smokers also seem to have poor treatment outcomes uh, 12 months later, as evidenced by greater fluid presence and greater central macular thickness. So what these findings suggest to us is that eye health care practitioners should be ensuring that those AMD patients that are presenting to them for therapy, that they're also um, following a healthy lifestyle because this would eventually mean uh, better treatment outcomes and uh, a higher likelihood that they're able to maintain their vision. So in terms of dietary interventions, as I said, we're, we're currently doing um, a, a project in this area. It's run by my uh, PhD student, Diana Tang. She is an accredited practicing dietitian, um, and it's a novel telephone delivered counseling program that aims to improve dietary behaviors uh, in AMD patients. Uh, and the aims of this intervention were twofold. Firstly, we want to uh, appreciably increase the intakes of vegetables, in particular dark green leafy vegetables, as well as fruit, fish, and low GI foods in these patients. Uh, we also want to improve adherence to ARIS type supplements as appropriate uh, in these patients. So the intervention involves a few components. Firstly, uh, we mail out to them a workbook and this workbook has some key messages around nutrition and AMD, and it's based on the latest dietary guidelines in Australia. It's also based on robust contemporary research evidence on diet and AMD. And then Diana does these four monthly phone calls, which follow the four A's approach, which is assessment, advice, and arranging follow-up. So with the assessment stage, she uh, provides feedback on the current dietary practices of AMD patients that are enrolled in intervention. With advice, um, she supports them or informs them about optimal dietary behaviours to minimise AMD risk. And at the assistance stage, um, which is really about collaborative goal setting and developing a personalised plan to try and achieve those dietary goals. And finally, she provides follow-up support in, uh, over the telephone. Uh, and so it's really a, a four-month intervention and we're doing a three-month and six-month follow-up. So we're hoping to publish the findings of three-month follow-up uh, later this year, but so far it's looking very positive. Um, there seems to be effectiveness for this intervention, um, but I can't go into too much detail now. But what I can um, talk about, oh, and this is the action plan that's actually included in the workbook. So all the uh, patients that are involved in the intervention get this, and um, together with Diana, they complete this action plan, and it sort of helps them to keep on track to achieving the right type of diet for their type of AMD. It follows uh, the SMART goals format. So these are specific, uh, measurable uh, and attainable as well as realistic and timely goals. So I can present some data around uh, the pre-intervention uh, group. So before the intervention started, um, we assessed their diet. And what we found is that these AMD patients were generally meeting recommendations uh, for fruit intake and consumption of meat or alternatives. Um, so for example, males and females were averaging at least two serves of fish per week, and they were having at least two eggs per week. Uh, however, they were below recommendations for the intake of vegetables, grains, and dairy foods. Um, so male patients were only averaging half a serve of dark green leafy vegetables per week, um, and they were only consuming one serve of low GI grains per day. Um, females were a little bit better, but they were only averaging one serve of dark green leafy vegetables per week and getting only around one and a half serves 
of low GI greens per day. So what this suggests to us is uh, there's plenty of scope for improving the diet of these AMD patients. So we're thinking that, and we're hoping that this intervention is going to do that for them. Uh, but yeah, watch the space and we'll be able to update you later on the year about how effective the intervention is. So now I just want to wrap up by acknowledging that the BMES was supported by the NHMRC and uh, the Macular Disease Foundation, um, and I'm supported by an NHMRC fellowship. I'd also like to thank all our participants who um, give up their time to take part in all our research projects. Thank you. Oh, and that's my contact details, should you want to uh, email me or contact me through to Twitter uh, for any queries. Okay, thank you so much for that, uh, Professor Goffner. That was extremely informative. Um, I think we all learnt a lot. Um, so just a reminder to everybody, if you do have any questions, um, please feel free again to click on that icon of the question mark inside the speech bubble and pop in your question in the white rectangle below and then select send. Before we do move on to the questions, um, I would like to talk quickly about the Macular Disease Foundation Australia. There are four pillars uh, to our work, all with the goal of trying to reduce the incidence and impact of macular disease in Australia. Now, our first pillar, so that's prevention and early detection, we provide accurate, current and ongoing information to try and increase the awareness of macular diseases nationwide. Uh, last year, we actually reached over 7,000 people just through our education sessions. Our second pillar, support and services. So we provide support for the entire macular community and we also facilitate access to other support services. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this uh, in, a, in a moment. And the voice of the macular community. So it is our privilege to advocate in the best interests of the macular community, whether it be designing policies for state and federal government or making sure that medical rebates are not cut. And finally, research and data. So 100% of funds donated to research go directly into our research grants program. We've actually donated over $4.1 million to 21 different Australian research projects since 2011. Now, this is how we can help you. So uh, that is our toll-free helpline number that you will see on your screen at the moment. Uh, it's not just for IT problems or webinars, but you can find uh, more information on there. So that number is 1-800-111-709. So not only can we answer questions about nutrition and AMD, but if you have questions about diabetic eye disease, or perhaps you have questions about my age care or even Medicare rebates, we can provide you information. Um, if you would like to um, access information online instead, you can go onto our website, which is www.mdfoundation.com.au and all of our resources are available on there and you can have that uh, delivered to your house for free if you'd like to do so. Um, if you uh, do have questions, you can also email us at education at mdfoundation.com.au. Now, speaking of questions, we actually have a lot of questions coming through, so I might go straight to that and have uh, Professor Goffnath come back and help us with answering those questions. Okay, so like I said, a lot of questions, so we'll try and get through as many of them as we can. Uh, so first question, I think you already touched on this, but I'll ask this anyway. Um, it says, as a vegan, I don't eat fish. What alternatives are there for getting uh, the active ingredients found in fish? So I think the main thing is the omega-3 fatty acids. Um, and so there are a range of uh, options with foods that do have omega-3 fatty acids enriched. Um, additionally, supplements. Um, is another way to go if you're not if you think you're not getting the right amount of omega-3 fatty acids in your diet. Um, but yeah, so 
uh, I'm just trying to think of foods that would be enriched or fortified with omega-3 fatty acids and I can't seem to think of too many. I mean, if you're a vegan, I guess you won't be eating eggs because they're another good source, but nuts, um, some nuts have got a large amount of fatty acids. Well, not as much as fish and eggs, but um, that's another way to get it as well. A good alternative. Something like pistachio nuts, maybe? Pistachio nuts, yes. Okay, perfect. So you were mentioning, you know, taking supplements for those omega-3s. Um, somebody asked about fish oil supplements, so fish oil or krill oil. Um, would that work? Yes. I mean, the thing is, the best way that the research is telling us, um, rather than omega-3 fatty acid supplements, there's not a, a huge amount um, of data to support that these supplements can minimise risk. Um, it's more the actual consumption of fish, um, which is not the strong research evidence to show that they are, you know, consuming two serves of fish is the best way to um, ensure that you get that right amount of uh, omega-3 fatty acids in your diet to minimise your risk of AMD. So the, 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 the data around omega-3 fatty acid supplements is not that strong. Mm, okay. So, but uh, I guess the overall message is, um, if you can, it's better to eat that fish. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, now, if we move on to nuts, what are the best type of nuts to eat? Um, so, Delini said, um, pistachio nuts are great. Um, almonds, walnuts. I just think, um, particularly walnuts, I think they have um, a really good source of um, good fats that are essential for good eye health. Um, so um, I can double check because I'm not a dietitian. So I can check with the dietitians that I work with or Delini, you might have um, more info around this. But um, with the Blue Mountain study, we looked at a whole bunch of nuts that we weren't able to tease out what specific type of nuts they were taking. It was just like whether you can do um, nuts in general. Um, but I think pistachio nuts and walnuts are a great source okay. of fatty acids and, and lutein and zeaxanthin as well. Mm, perfect. Um, so another question is, um, do you know of any research studies which comment on the effect of canola oil, palm oil and vegetable, vegetable oils um, in relation to age-related macular degeneration? Um, so I think we touched on this as a group. Um, and we weren't able to see any associations, um, but I know that other groups have shown that intake of vegetable oil might not be so great um, for eye health. Um, but I think either way, the evidence isn't so strong. Um, mm. So I think it's um, I think it's a little bit unclear the evidence around. Um, vegetable oil and AMD. Um, there are some groups who've been able to show an increased risk, but we weren't able to show that in our group. Okay, right, okay. Um, now, I know we've been talking a lot about sort of, you know, the nutritional um, intake that we can have to have an impact on AMD. Um, someone would like to know whether it's only about reducing your risk of being diagnosed, or can it also help slow down progress once you have been diagnosed? It is both. So um, it can minimise risk of future development of AMD, but once you've got AMD, it can certainly help minimise progression or worsening of existing AMD. Perfect. Um, and someone has, I think you were um, speaking quickly about anti-VEGF injections for wet uh, AMD. Someone asked, uh, what is anti-VEGF? So uh, it stands for vascular endothelial growth factor, anti-VEGF. Um, it's, it's the therapy that's given to patients who have wet AMD um, and it's to stop um, the progression of vision loss. It helps to minimise um, the scarring of the macula. Um, so yes, but it's only for wet AMD patients and um, it doesn't, it's not uh, applicable to patients who have dry AMD. Dry, okay. 
Um, another question about supplements. Um, I think this is specifically to do with ARIDS2 supplements. Um, it's Are supplements actually harmful for people with early AMD? Um, you recommended it for people in intermediate stages in one eye or both eyes or late stage in one. So can people in the early stages still take it? Um, I think it's recommend, I don't know if it's harmful, but it's just generally not recommended for people who have early AMD signs. There's just no efficacy, there's no evidence for efficacy for this group of patients. Okay, perfect. Um, another question, if I am taking an ARIDS2 supplement, does that mean I shouldn't bother with a healthy diet? Oh no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, yeah. You've got to ensure, I think the best way to get these nutrients is through a healthy diet. Um, the ARIDS2 supplements obviously um, give you that high dose that you can't get through the diet, but a healthy diet is going to help you in a range of other uh, ways. So it can help you minimise progression or development of a range of other chronic diseases like heart disease, diabetes. So um, the advice is always to try and maintain a healthy diet, even if you are taking ARIDS2 supplements. Okay, perfect. Um, someone has asked, um, what about other seafoods such as prawns and calamari? I think they're referring to the omega-3 um, fatty acids there. So are other seafoods okay as well? Do they have high levels? Um, as I said, it's they don't have the levels that we see um, in those oily fish. So it is, I mean, um, they're fine, but uh, I don't think they're going to get you those levels that you need um, adequately for your macula. So um, the recommendation is always to consume more of those oily fish types like salmon is a great source of um, omega-3 fatty acids. Hmm. Um, and another question, are there any foods that should be avoided? Any foods? Like, as I said, those high glycemic index foods should mm. definitely be avoided. So um, they're the ones that give you that spike in your blood sugar and insulin levels, which are known to be harmful, um, not just for AMD development, but for a range of chronic diseases. So all those, um, I guess we call discretionary food items that we don't really need, they have empty calories. Um, mm. So things like your junk food, um, so, you know, uh, fizzy drinks, those sort of things that we really, should be consuming much less of, um, yeah. and definitely things like white bread and so on. Yeah, um, this is a, a little bit of a more specific question, but I think in the same vein as those oils that we were talking about, um, is it better to eat butter or margarine if you have AMD? <laughs> oh, that's, yeah, it's a hard one. I mean, mm. um, I don't know what what the right answer for that would be. Um, I think with margarine, as I said, there is some studies to show that it isn't so great, but the evidence is still not conclusive. Um, and then with butter, obviously, there is uh, issues around how it can influence cholesterol and so on. Um, but I think everything in moderation, that's my advice. Yes, I think that's a very good rule of thumb, everything in moderation. Mm. <laughs> Um, okay, sorry, there's so many questions. I might just uh, do a couple more before we finish up. Um, smoked salmon versus fresh salmon, is one considered better than the other? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I would assume smoked salmon would be better. I mean, sorry, fresh salmon would be better rather than smoked salmon. Uh, but again, I'm not a dietitian and I really think I can definitely follow that up for you and see um, which is a better alternative. But I think salmon in any form is great um, and it's your preference, but I would think fresh salmon would have higher content, but I'm... Mm. Mm, I think, yeah, that would probably be a question um, to maybe we'll look into that and, and, and get back to um, the person that asked. Okay, um, there are a few questions which are gen about general uh, macular degeneration as well. So um, a few people have asked what's the difference between wet and dry uh, macular degeneration. Um, I'm not sure if we have time to go over those questions. Um, to, so to those people, um, please feel free to give a helpline a call and we will uh, spend you know, some time going through all of that. Um, 
I do have another question here just about um, ARIDS2 supplementation. Um, is there a reason why it's not um, recommended for someone in the advanced stages in both eyes? Sorry, what was, I didn't quite get that, the last. Sorry, so um, the, for ARIDS2 supplementation, is there a reason why it is not recommended for people um, who have advanced stages in both eyes? Um, it's not that it's recommended, not recommended, it's just the fact that they've already got late stage AMD in both eyes, so taking those supplements isn't necessarily going to prevent um, progression. Um, because they've already developed it, so it's more the fact that it's not just it's not an effective um, option for these patients anymore. Um, it's really the supplements are recommended only in the stage where you can minimise um, progression to developing the late form or advanced stage of AMD. That's generally when these supplements are recommended, and that's why we say people who have advanced in both eyes, it's it wouldn't be um, recommended or probably of no use at that stage, I think. Mm, yeah, and, and I think some of those tablets can be a little bit expensive as well. Um, so mm. worthwhile looking at whether, you know, the effectiveness of them. Okay, perfect. Well, um, I think we'll have to leave it there for the questions. Um, I do apologise to those um, who did ask questions, but I wasn't able to get to them. Um, you're more than welcome um, to give us a call or email us with your questions and we can definitely go through them. Um, so thank you so much, um, Professor Bhavani Gopinath, for joining us today. Um, and thank you so much for going uh, through those questions as well. We really appreciate it. Um, that was my pleasure. <laughs> thank you.